Did you ever get the feeling, sure you have, that God likes other people better than you? <laughs> huh? Boy, when old Irma was bearing down on us, I knew God liked Cargill better than he liked me. <laughs> of course, you get tornadoes up here. Somebody else has a stronger church. Somebody else has better health. Somebody else has a bigger salary. Somebody else has a bigger car. <laughs> Why does God like that person better than he likes me? Well, we're going into the Word today, and let's see what happens. This is the story of Elisha. It's out of the book of 2 Kings. Man, what a book. A few years ago, I got a new secretary, and she came into my office one day, and she said, I don't understand it. The previous pastor who was here, and I was his secretary, he'd be in his study reading the Word, and I'd hear him going, oh, Hallelujah, glory to God. And out of your office, I just hear gales of laughter. She said, are you reading the same book? <laughs> the most incredible stories ever given to mankind, given to us by the Holy Ghost, are in this book. And this is one of them. Now, Israel and Syria are at war. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Every new administration comes in. We're going to solve those problems in the Middle East. Sure you are. There's one coming who will, but you ain't him. <laughs> Chapter 6 of 2 Kings. The king of Syria, who happened to be a guy named, named Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad. Bad man. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, in such and such a place shall be my camp. In other words, he's setting up ambushes. We're going to ambush those Israelis. And the man of God, Elisha, down in Israel, living in Dothan, sent unto the king of Israel, who was Joram, also a rotten guy, offspring of Ahab, saying, Beware thou pass not such a place, for the Syrians are come down. Don't go that way, king of Israel, because the Syrians are waiting in ambush for you down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, not once or twice, but at least three times, these elaborate ambushes by the Syrians get blown out because the Israelis never show up. Verse 11, therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled. That's King James for torqued <laughs> for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? All right, you guys, which one of you is the traitor? Which one of you guys is sending down to the king of Israel? Tell him where our ambush is going to be. Which one of you? One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. It's Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel. I'm sorry, but this is just a funny line to me. He tells the king of Israel, The word you even speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Man, this is a good story. And it gets even better. And he said, Ben-Hadad said, go spy where this man is that I may send and fetch him. I'm going to kill him. And it was told him, saying, he's in Dothan. I've been in Dothan a lot of times. Israel's kind of my home away from home. And Dothan's a little old jerkwater town up in Samaria. It's a good coffee shop there, by the way, if you're ever through there. This is where he lives. He's in Dothan. Therefore, the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city abroad. Now, turn on that screen in your brain called imagination. I want you to see this little old house where Elisha lives. 
He's got a new hired hand. In the previous chapter, Gehazi became a leper, remember? So now he's got a new guy. We don't know his name. I'm going to call him Fred. He's got a new man named Fred. I can see him. So here's the house of Elisha. It's dead of night, surrounded by the Syrian army. <laughs> when the servant of the man of God, Fred, rose early and went outside, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. I'll help you. Here he's going outside, maybe to get the paper, the milk bottle, something. And he looks... Helping those of you with no imagination. <laughs> Syrians. Syrian war. And the man of God said, Alas, that just cracks me up. Alas. I say that so many times in times of peril, don't you? Alas. <laughs> what shall we do? Now listen to Elisha. He's so different from Elijah. And Elisha answered, fear not. Fred said, too late. <laughs> Elisha said, they that be with us. I always think of Elisha like Schuler, you know. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. <laughs> so Fred goes back outside. Twenty-eight thousand six hundred twelve. Twenty-eight thousand six hundred twelve. He goes back inside to Elisha. <laughs> this is a good story, man. I get tickled reading this book. Verse seventeen. Elisha prayed and said, "Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see." And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Bum, ba, da, ba, ba, da. Read this book with feeling to your people. <laughs> they were around Elisha. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, take them out, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Now, I don't know if Elisha's having a bad day or if he's an inveterate practical joker, but this is the king joke of all time. Listen to this. And Elisha came down to the Syrians now who are blind, and he said to them, This is not the way. Neither is this the city. You're in the wrong place here. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man you seek. And he led them to Samaria. This is why the Syrians never win wars, people. <laughs> I was in Damascus one day making a movie for some people. And I watched the Syrian soldiers on parade, and they were holding hands. <laughs> True. This is why they don't win. <laughs> so he led them to Samaria, and it came to pass when they were come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw and they were in the middle of Samaria. And Elisha goes, surprise! <laughs> and the king of Israel comes out, Joram, and he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And he said, thou shalt not kill them. Wouldst thou smite those with whom thou hast taken captive? Feed them. Feed them. And he prepared great provisions for the Syrians, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them their way, and they went back to their master in Damascus. And I love this line. So the bands of Syria 
came no more into the land of Israel. That's the twilight zone, baby. <laughs> we ain't going back there ever again, man. See, now we believe that God performs miracles. Is that my stomach or is that you? I don't know what it is. We believe in miracles, but not everybody gets one. I believe in divine healing. We pray for the sick. Not everybody gets healed. How come? Well, you know, one of the things about us uh, Pentecostals is if we don't know the answer, we make one up. It's not always right, but if it sounds good, then you know. And one, one of the answers we give, well, that person didn't get a miracle in his or her life because he didn't have enough faith. How do you know? What made you the judge? Didn't someone say one time, judge not that ye be not judged? So how, how do you know how much faith a person has? Or they have sin in their life. And how'd you know that? Unless you're a peeping Tom. My first year at Revival Time, I was flying down to Texas to preach, and it was like somebody hit my back with an axe, and it required spinal surgery. So I'm back out in the road not too long after that, and I'm somewhere, and I needed a haircut. So I went into a shop, and I didn't know that this shop was owned by a full-time card-carrying Pharisee. Pharisees are mean people. Jesus just told them off all the time. And I go into this guy, and he puts the apron around my neck, and he pulled back my shirt, and he saw that scar. And this man I've never seen in my life says to me, Oh! Oh! You've had surgery! I said, yeah. And he got right down in front of me, Another thing about Pharisees, they've never heard of Tic Tacs. So <laughs> here's, here's this Pharisee. I've never seen this man in my life. He said, sin in your life? I said, no, bone chip in my back. <laughs> the reason I was raised in a Pentecostal home is because a year before I was born there was a 20 year old woman dying at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sioux City 20 years old she weighed about 65 pounds dying of cancer totally eaten away with cancer and was now in the final coma doctors told her family she'd never recover there was a man named Willis Smith, a great Pentecostal Assemblies of God pastor in Sioux City, who was making his rounds in St. Vincent's Hospital. And the doctor, the, the, the Lord called him into this ward. Back in those days, it was wards, remember? Not just individual rooms. Called him into this room, and here's this, this skeletal creature gasping, the death rattle, unconscious, final call. And the preacher didn't know who she was. But he just felt led to pray for her. So he went over, took some oil, and anointed her head with oil and prayed for her. Didn't shake her. Didn't throw a coat at her. Didn't scream and yell. Just prayed. He said, Lord, I don't know who she is, but I ask you to heal her. And the pastor left the hospital. Three days later, so did she. My first cousin, Faye, she lived 65 more years. And it was out of that miracle that our whole family was saved and became Pentecostal. Now, my dear mother, God bless her, developed the same cancer, went through the same thing, prayed for, anointed. She was a believer. Faye wasn't a believer. She was unconscious. How much faith does an unconscious non-believer have? 
my mother had more faith than anybody I knew. And she died. So explain that. You say there is no explanation. Oh, yeah, there is. This is why as pastors we have the obligation to preach some solid theology. When we talk about God, we talk about his attributes. His attributes are who he is. And one of the attributes of God is his sovereignty. When's the last time you preached a sermon on God's sovereignty? Which simply means God can do anything he wants to do with anybody he chooses, anytime, anywhere. He is sovereign. We're not. Well, then that means that God leads us along different roads. We don't all go on the same pathway. This person was healed. Why am I not? God is sovereign. We used to sing some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, all through the blood. There are different ways God leads us. That's why we don't compare ourselves to other people. Well, I remember my short term in Bible school. I was 17. And uh, I was called into the dean's office, and he told me, you might as well leave college, Bible college. You'll never be a preacher. You don't have, you don't think like a preacher. You don't act like a preacher. Well, you know, back in those days, if you wanted to be a Pentecostal preacher, you had to preach. I like that. And I want you to know how. That's the way it goes. Well, I was doing the 6 o'clock news at KYTV out of Springfield. I never came on the news at night. Now we're going to have uh, the news around the world. After people would turn off their TV all over. <laughs> so they said to me, you'll never be a preacher. I made the mistake of telling the dean, the one who called me has nails in his hands, nail prints. You don't have any. The one who called you has nail prints in his hands. And he does not lead you where everybody else goes. Well, that's your theory. That's your, oh, no, no. Let me prove it to you from Scripture. Let's go way back to the beginning. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. This is the story of Joseph. His dad sends him off north out of Beersheba to look for his brothers. His brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. In Israel, Jacob said to Joseph, Do not your brethren lead the flock in Shechem? Come, I'll send you unto them. He said, Here am I. And he said, Go, I pray thee, see if it's well with your brothers, well with the flocks, and bring me word. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and he was wandering in the field. See, Jacob's just a kid. He's only about 17, 18. He's a typical kid. And he can't see his brothers. He can't find them. So he's just walking around Shechem there, chewing his gum, because you can't be a teenager unless you chew gum. And he walks up to some guy. I'm, I'm looking for my brothers and stuff. <laughs> well, I saw your brothers leave. They went up to Dothan. Oh, really? Dothan. That's a good place, boy. That's where the chariots of fire saved Elisha's eyes. Dothan. If he's going to Dothan, he'll be great. Hmm? So he goes to Dothan. There are in Dothan, verse 16, when his brothers saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They said, here comes that dreamer. Let's slay him and cast him into some pit. We'll tell dad some evil beast has devoured him. And we'll see what shall become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, let's not kill him. 
shed no blood, but cast him into this pit. And on their way, they saw a whole parade of, I'm cutting through here, of slave traders. They stripped Joseph out of his coat, put him in the pit. The pit was empty, no water in it. They lifted up their eyes. Here came a company of Ishmaelite slave traders from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh going to carry it to Egypt. And Judas said, what profit is it? There's no money in it if we slay your brother. Let's sell him. Let's sell him to the Midianites. Let not our hand be upon him. They passed by the Midianites. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and they were about to sell him when suddenly the whole band of Ishmaelites was surrounded by chariots of fire and... Oh, wait a minute. No angels, no chariots of fire. He's in the right place. He's in Dothan for crying out loud. That's where that happens. And they sold him. So how come, you've got to ask yourself, how come God liked Elisha better than Joseph? Elisha gets delivered miraculously by chariots of fire. Joseph, as a teenage kid, gets sold into slavery. He's going to be in slavery for a long time. The old penitentiary of Tar, historians call it, is probably the worst prison in history at that time. And he's going to spend years there. Well, Joseph finds himself in that rat-infested prison, that place of mud and mire and muck and filth and he picks himself up and he says well I just don't receive this <laughs> boy some of today's theology is so crazy it's not theology really he spent all that time there how come how come he was treated differently because God had two different things in mind for two different people. Elisha, he's going to be a prophet of God, so God delivered him. But Joseph was going to become the second most powerful man in the world. And to get Joseph there, God had to take him to a place called Dothan. You ever been to Dothan? Oh, yeah. Sometimes pastors come through and they see the church in Fort Myers. They say, well, you've just always been at the right place at the right time. Yeah. You weren't there the first year. When one of the people in the church blew up our car in the driveway one night and tried to kill us, going on the police blotters, attempted murder. Assembly of God guy. I don't want to shock you, but do you know that mean assemblies of God people are the meanest people in the world? <laughs> They're meaner than Baptists. <laughs> they are. Because the Baptists know it doesn't matter. They're saved anyhow. But the Assemblies of God people know they're going to hell. Makes them meaner. Had the windows in the church shot out night after night. Death threats. You weren't there then, were you? God leads his dear children along, boy, some through the water. We know about that. We just went through Irma. I've sat through three of those hurricanes now. Some through the flood, oh yeah. Some through the fire, but all through the blood. I want to tell you a little Bible story out of the last chapter of John. I go to Israel every year. I have to go every year. It's my home. 
been going there now almost every year for 40 years. I know Israel like the back of my hand. People say, what's your favorite place? It's a little place called Mensa Christi, Table of the Lord, Mensa Christi. It's about two miles south of Capernaum, which is where Jesus lived the last three and a half years of his ministry. First 30 years, he lived in Nazareth. I always tell people, Nazareth's way up in the mountains. It's a crummy town. It's cold. It's cold. It's snowy. Icy, it's creepy town. So as soon as Jesus could, he moved to four, down to <laughs> He moved to Capernaum, which is 700 feet below sea level, and it's exactly like Fort Myers. It's by the water. The vegetation is the same. And Nazareth is kind of like Detroit. So when Jesus was 30, as soon as he could, he left Michigan and he came to Florida. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But two miles south of Capernaum is the spot where after the resurrection, Jesus cooked breakfast for his disciples. Peter and six other of the disciples had gone fishing. Most of the fishing, the good fishing, is on the north end of the sea. They had fished all night and had caught nothing. I have fished with those guys many times, by the way. By the way, I've caught some bodacious bass out of this lake you're sitting on. So if you like to fish, there's some big ones in here. But they'd caught nothing. Now they're rowing back. They don't have an Evan Root on that boat. They're rowing back, big old heavy with the boat. And Peter is upset. He's been fishing all night. And they come within a couple hundred yards of the shore. They have to because they're coming into the dock there at Capernaum. You know exactly where they were. So they're rowing in. The sun's just starting to come up over the Golan Heights. They've caught nothing all night long. And there's a guy standing over on the bank. You can see it. There's a fire going over there. See it? There's a guy standing there. And he hollers out, you guys catch anything? No, we didn't catch anything. That's so irritating when people ask you that. You fish. Didn't catch anything. And the man standing over there said, put your net on the other side of the boat. John said, it's the Lord. Peter said, I don't care who it is. <laughs> there ain't no fish here. Well, it's the Lord. You ought to put your net on the other side of the boat. John, listen to me. I'm a professional fisherman. He's a carpenter. There's no fish here. Forget about it. Throw the net on the other side of the boat. So they do. <laughs> what does it say? 253 fish, I think. Fill the net. Almost broke the net. getting it up. And they go over to the bank where Jesus is cooking breakfast for them. You stand on the exact spot where this happened. You can smell the fish frying. Well, if, if they weren't catching fish, how'd Jesus get them? Because he was the Lord. He just said, fish. <laughs> Man, they were in the pan. So I stand there, and, and I always get goosebumps standing. This is where this happened. And John and Peter are over here eating. And John says, Peter, everything all right with you and the Lord? You know, after you denied him there in, in the Pilate's judgment hall, or Caiaphas hall, everything okay? Yeah, Jesus came to me, and everything seemed, well, that's good. I, I wondered how it would come out with you two guys. All of a sudden, Jesus says, Peter! Excuse me, John. Uh, yes, Lord, what is it? Peter, you love me? Yeah, I love you. Whew. John, he's pretty upset yet. He just asked me if I loved him. I told him I did. I don't know what to do. Peter! Excuse me, John. What? Peter, do you love me? I just told you. Yeah, I love you. Yes, I love you. Okay? I love you. 
This is a little nerve-wracking, John. I'm just Peter! Don't just stand there, John. Pray. <laughs> what? Peter. You really love me? Peter, did you see my hands? That's where the spike went through. <laughs> see that? Huh? Did you see my feet, Peter? Right through the instep. That's where the nail went through. Yeah. You love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. Well, you know what just happened to me, Peter, is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be crucified too. Now, enjoy your breakfast. <laughs> what? I said, enjoy your breakfast. No, no, before that. Oh, you're going to be crucified too. Just like me. And Peter turns, and here's John over here feeding his face with fish. What about him? Huh? Is, is John going to be crucified too? Jesus said, what I do with John is none of your business. You follow me. That's God's sovereignty. Some of you may be going through a tough time right now. We have a lot of people down in Florida going through a tough time now. <laughs> Does that mean God doesn't love them anymore? No. God is sovereign. It comes as a great shock to some people to realize that God, I don't want to shock you here, but God is smarter than you are. And when we give ourselves to him, sometimes he takes us through the flood. Sometimes he takes us through the fire. We all go through the blood. But God leads his dear children along. No, God doesn't love somebody more than he loves you. But he's sovereign. We just sang earlier, trust him, trust him. 